faces. So it's lovely to see you all. If you are visiting or if you're watching for the very first time, you are so welcome with us. We're pleased that all of you have chosen to join with us this morning. And we've just been praying that you will sense God's presence, that you will hear his voice speaking to you. Um, wherever you are, whether you're sitting here in a pew or whether you're watching from home. But just as we start, some announcements for the coming week. The elders are meeting on Zoom this Monday night at 8 p.m. On Thursday night, we would love you to join us on Facebook Live um, where we will be praying hope over Donna Hadee and Carol will be leading us in that. So 8 p.m. this Thursday night. The GB and BB prayer meeting is on Friday night at 7 p.m. If you would like to join that, that's on Zoom. You can get the Zoom code by messaging our Facebook page or Phil or Ashleen or some of the BB or GB leaders. But again, it's just an invaluable way to pray for the boys and girls. And because we have no Sunday school at the moment, um, we had decided months back to do services that would be suitable for children, shorter services um, during the third Sunday of the month. So next Sunday is one of those services and anyone is welcome to sign up to come, but priority will be given to families with young children. Um, but again, you are welcome to sign up. But we've come to worship. We have come to declare how good God is, how much we love him, how worthy he is of our attention, how we long to give him first place in our hearts and our lives. So as we come to prayer, let me read from Psalm 16. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You're enough God. You satisfy, you make my lot secure. I'm safe with you, God. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance with hope with God. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord with him at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Father God, you are our security. You are our hope. We don't have anything to fear when you are on our side. We keep our eyes fixed on you. And when our eyes are fixed on you, we know that we will not be shaken. But Lord, we need you to help us to keep our eyes fixed on you, to help us be satisfied with you to not look elsewhere for security. Forgive us, Father, when we forget that you satisfy us, when we take our eyes off you and what you are doing. Forgive us when we ignore or block out your word and neglect to worship you. Lord, we are so thankful that you don't give up on us. We are so thankful that you forgive our sins and give us second chances and new beginnings. Thank you, Father. As we come to worship, Lord, would you fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit? We want to worship you more clearly. We want to worship you more freely. Holy Spirit, would you reveal the wonder and greatness of God as we worship? We love you, Lord, and we thank you for your presence here. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to hand over to the band as they lead us. Please stand. Good morning, everybody. Let's join in worship together. Everybody's looking bright and and lovely and smart this morning. Let's, let's sing our praises to God together. Let everybody like to, to stand.
to the feet of Jesus. Everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Please be seated. Um, birthday blessing time. Just wondering, has anyone had a birthday even in here? You can't really come up, but no birthdays, no hands going up. No, no. Well, we'll pray for oh, Elaine. Somebody's nudging you. Have you a birthday? Uh, 21. Yeah. Well, let's pray for anyone listening at home. If you've had a birthday this past week and you would like a birthday blessing, um, for adults, you'll probably get a bar of chocolate through your door. Um, for young people and children, um, you'll get a little treat of some description. So please do let us know on our Facebook page. Um, but we we'll bless you um, in Jesus' name. So let's pray for those who've had a birthday. Father, thank you for birthdays. Um, thank you. It's a sign that we are alive, that you have made us. You've created us. We are yours. And I pray for every boy and girl who's had a birthday this past week. I pray that they will know how valued and special they are, that you have plans and purposes for their life, and um, that they will know that the Father God just adores them. Um, and Lord, I pray for every adult. I just pray that you will do a new work in their life and heart um, over this year, that there'll just be signs of your spirit moving, bless and encourage and strengthen each one. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And we're going to have our children's um, talk. So we're going to watch a video first of all. So watch the screen. The Faithful Hall of Fame. Joseph. So this is Joseph. Hey! You see, Joseph was the son of Israel and Rachel. Israel loved Joseph more than all 12 of his sons. In fact, he made Joseph a coat to show him how much he loved it. <laughs> when Joseph's brothers saw this, they hated Joseph. <laughs> One night, Joseph had a dream. When he awoke, Joseph told the dream to his brothers. He said, listen to this dream I had. We were gathering grain when suddenly my bundle of grain rose up and all of you bowed to me. This made his brothers hate Joseph even more. And they said, you're going to rule over us? <laughs> then Joseph had another dream. And he told it to his brothers and his father. He said, listen, I had another dream. And this time, the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. This time, Israel heard the dream and rebuked Joseph, saying, Will your mother and brothers and I actually come and bow down before you? The brothers were even more angry when they heard the second dream. Israel, however, decided to think about what Joseph was saying. So we are starting a new series, so you'll find out what happens next. Um, the next week we are covering this series, but from watching that video, we can tell that Joseph's brothers felt a whole heap of envy um, because, well, what was the reason? Joseph's dad liked Joseph the best. Joseph got the bright colored coat, that's why I thought I'd wear brights today. Joseph got a bright colored coat, his brothers didn't. And sometimes I think we all can feel a little bit envious, a little bit jealous, just like Joseph's brothers, when we don't get what we want. Think about when your best friend comes in and they have the toy that you have wanted for ages. Or someone in your class gets the latest Xbox, iPhone, and you're sitting there with a really old one. Sometimes in our house, People can get a bit jealous if this slice of cake is a bit bigger for one than the other. I'll not tell you who is jealous. 
All of us can feel jealous at certain times. And Joseph's brothers were jealous that his dad loved him more than them and gave him this really great present. They were jealous that Joseph had these dreams and it made Joseph look like he was going to be boss over them all and they just didn't like it. They didn't react very well. It says in the Bible that they hated him and that they couldn't speak a kind word to him. Think about yourself. What do you do when you feel jealous? Do you feel that hate kind of in your heart? Do you say unkind things about the person or to the person? Do you just huff and mope about? And as, as I was reading this and thinking about it, I was thinking, well, God, what do you want us to do in this situation? And I came across 1 Corinthians 13, a passage that's read at weddings, but it's actually a passage that we really need to remember. And it says this in 1 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. You see, God wants us to love people. And one way of showing love to people is not envying them. It's not envying what they have. And another way is being kind to them, even when you are feeling that little green-eyed monster inside of you. So I wonder, could you repeat the verse after me? I'll say a line and you just repeat it after me. It'll stick in your head. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 4, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 4. Love is. <laughs> love is what? <laughs> Patient, thank you. Love is. It does not. It does not. It is not. Very impressed. If you're watching at home, these guys are really, really good. But I think one thing that we can do is we can ask God to help us to be happy for other people, even when they get something that we really, really wanted. We can be happy for them when they get something and we don't get anything. We can ask God to help us say something kind or do something kind. So when your friend tells you that they got the latest Xbox game and you've been nagging your parents for ages for it, you can just say, I'm really glad for you. <laughs> when your little brother or sister gets that new pair of trainers and you still have to wear the old ones, we can say, I'm really glad you got those. <laughs> you know, Joseph's brothers weren't happy or glad when Joseph got the new coat. Instead, they were really jealous and it made them do things that they really shouldn't have done and things that they would end up regretting. Sometimes it's not easy to be glad for others when they get the thing that you really want. But God doesn't want us envy and he doesn't want us being unkind to one another. So will we pray together? Because I think we all need God's help to not envy, to not be unkind to others. Let's pray. Dear Father God, would you help us to be kind to one another? Kind when we are feeling like we really want to be unkind. Would you help us when we feel jealous or envious of what other people have? Would you help us to be glad for others instead of sad for ourselves? Holy Spirit, we need you to help us with that, this because we find it hard to do on our own. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd love you to stand again and we're gonna sing um, a song together. You can join in the actions. Um, love came down. <coughs>
really impressed Gillian at your energy at doing those and Isla as well. Love that song. It's great to have a new song, isn't it? I think it'll take us all a few weeks to learn those actions, but it's a really lovely song. Thank you so much. We're going to come to a time of just prayer for other people and um, other situations. Um, if you've been watching the news at all this week, um, it's been quite a week both internationally and in our own wee country. There's been so much heartache, so much pain, so much that should bring us to our knees in prayer. So let's join together now in prayer for others. Lord, help us to look beyond ourselves and our situation. Whatever we're thinking right now, whatever's going on inside of our heads, help us to look out, to push out. Lord, we lift our country before you. We pray for our government here and in Westminster. We pray for wisdom. We pray for unity. We pray for reconciliation and trust among the parties. We pray that the good of our country would be foremost in the minds of leaders and seeking a way forward would be the main goal. We pray that tensions would ease, that communication would increase, that criticisms would be constructive. Lord God, we pray for our local leaders, those who are working on the ground in areas that are affected by rioting and disruption. Lord, we do pray against those sinister forces we pray against the darkness. We pray against those who seek to divide and disrupt. We think of our young people, those who've been caught up in situations that from watching the news just seem out of control. Those who are being labeled as either heroes or villains. We pray for each one of them. We pray God that you would give them a fresh vision for their life, a new purpose for their life. We pray for hope for them. Father, we pray for their safety. We pray for the adults who get involved in trouble and violence, who have sought to solve problems with violence. We pray, God, that you would have mercy on them. Again, we pray for fresh vision for them, fresh purpose, renewed hope. We pray that communities would shift and change for good. We pray for all those out working on the streets, trying to keep things calm. We pray that you would protect our emergency services, that you would give them wisdom how to proceed in times of conflict. Father God, our hearts are sad. We know that so much bubbles beneath the surface. We know that things are shaky in our country and we pray again and again for your peace. We pray for an outpouring of your spirit on our land. We pray that you would do miraculous works in people's hearts, that you would turn people from darkness to light, bringing truth where there are lies, bringing life where the stench of death is strong. Lord, we pray for our world, for countries in conflict, countries where people live their lives in fear, countries where people do not have enough to survive on and countries that are suffering really badly from this pandemic. Lord, we pray for the governments around the world, for those in power, those who have influence. We pray that they would have wisdom in how they lead, that they would seek the good of their country, the good of all the people. Lord, we pray that you would move in these days. Lord, we need you, our world needs you. We need your light, your hope, your order. Father, today we pray for our queen and the whole royal family as they mourn the loss of Prince Philip. We pray that you would bring each member of the family comfort, that you would be close to them that they would know your peace, that they would know your presence at this time. 
We pray for all those who have faced loss and are grieving. We pray that you would meet them in their time of sorrow, that you would comfort them and that you would help them. We pray for broken hearts and ask, Holy Spirit, would you minister to them? We pray for those who are ill. We pray for those who are waiting on treatment, on results, those who are undergoing new treatment, those who just feel weak and heavy burdened. Lord, again, we pray your peace. We pray your help. We pray your healing. We pray your hope. Lord, in the darkest of days, we pray that your light would shine and that your light would penetrate through the darkness that people are facing and feeling. Father, again, we just pray for our church family here. Thank you for this opportunity to meet again in person and we pray for more. Like it's just to take a moment in silence to bring personal concerns before the Lord. People who are on your heart, situations that are on your heart this morning. Thank you that you are a God who hears. Thank you that you are a God who knows, a God who is in control, and a God who speaks. We pray trusting in you and you alone. Amen. Amen. Well, as I said to the boys and girls, uh, we're starting a new series um, leading us up to June, um, and we're going to be focusing on the life of Joseph, and Joseph is one of those Bible characters that you all know something about. Um, perhaps you know his whole story from the Bible, or maybe you just associate him with the musical Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Maybe some of you could sing some of the songs here this morning. Um, I pray that God this morning would give us fresh perspective because sometimes we come to familiar stories and we think we know all of that. We've read it and heard it before. But I'm just praying that God will speak to us this morning and just give us new words through his word. But before we um, go into the story of Joseph, I think it's really important to kind of look at the family tree and hopefully it will come up maybe on the screen of a bit of a family tree Yes, we're going to start back in Abraham. Abraham was a father of the Jewish race and God made that covenant or promise to him that he was going to have loads and loads and loads of descendants, as many as the stars in the sky, sand on the beach, um, and that they would belong to God, that God would be their God, he would be their people. God promised to bless them, he promised to give them their own land. So when Abraham received this promise, he was obedient um, he was obedient for a while and then time started to go on and on and on. And then him and his wife, Sarah, got a bit skeptical about this because it didn't seem to be happening straight away. God had made a promise, but nothing's happening. And the main point was that Sarah hadn't been able to have children. She was getting older. There was no children on the horizon. So she was thinking, how are we going to have so many descendants? They thought it was all a bit unrealistic. So Abraham took matters into his own hands and he slept with one of his servants, Hagar, and they had a child, Ishmael. But this child wasn't the one that God had promised to be the part of this descendant line. He wasn't the one to continue on the family line. And it's interesting that God didn't give up on Abraham. Even though Abraham showed that lack of faith and trust and impatience, God didn't take his promise away. He didn't take the covenant away from him. And he eventually did give Abraham and Sarah a son in their old age, a son called Isaac. And if you turn to Genesis 22, 21, 22, you get the story of Isaac there. And so Isaac grew up and he married a girl called Rebecca. And they had twin boys called Esau and Jacob. Is all this coming back to you now? It's all coming I'll come back. Sometimes I forget all this family line. So this was as much for me as for you. But they had twin boys, Esau and Jacob. Very different boys, very different gifts, very different personalities. And already in this wee family, we see rivalry, favoritism, and deceit. 
Esau was born first. He came out first, so he would have had the right of all of the inheritance. He would have really been the favored one in the family. But he didn't really want this position. He didn't really favor it. And so he gave that right over to Jacob, his brother, for basically a bowl of stew. Sounds ridiculous to us, but he passed it over for a bowl of stew. Jacob then went on to trick his father, pretending to be Esau, into giving him the blessing for all of the descendants. So it meant that Jacob ended up next in line in this particular family tree. Jacob and Esau's difficulties continue. How could it not? Because of all that had happened and resulted in Jacob running away to a relative for protection and really help. So he found himself across the path of this really beautiful girl called Rachel. It was love at first sight. So he went to Laban, her father, and he said, I really want to marry her. And Laban agreed. He said, yes, yes, you can marry her, but what do you have to do? Work for me for seven years. So when you're in love, what do you do? You do what you have to do. So he works hard. And finally, after seven years, they come to an end and he finds himself at the altar. But here Laban then plays a trick on Jacob. And instead of giving him Rachel, he gives him his elder daughter called Leah. Leah wasn't as attractive as Rachel, according to the Bible. And during the wedding, she kept her face veiled. So Jacob's standing at the altar, lovely Rachel, but it's only after the wedding, after it's all done and dusted, ding, ding, it's not Rachel, it is actually Leah. Poor Jacob didn't realize what had happened until it was too late. He was married to the wrong sister. And so even though he had made this commitment to Leah, he still had eyes for Rachel. He wanted her too. She was his very first love and he wasn't giving up on her. So Laban said, yes, yes, of course, you can have my daughter, Rachel. But what do you have to do? Work for me for seven years. Guys here, young guys who aren't married, can you imagine meeting the girl of your dreams and waiting 14 years, working for her father for 14 years before you could have her? That was the situation in those days. And every time I read the story, I think of poor Leah. Poor Leah. Imagine being married to a man who more or less wanted your sister. You were always second best. Nothing that you did. Those fancy steak dinners, they wouldn't compare to Rachel's chips. Like you just couldn't match up. You would never live up to her. But Leah didn't walk away. She actually had this major advantage to Rachel because she was able to have children. And Rachel at that point wasn't able to. So Leah had, which you'll see in the line, Leah had Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Rachel, then she thought, well, phew, this isn't right. So she got her maidservant called who's that? Bella, Bila, Bilha. I need somebody with good Hebrew. Bilha, who gave Jacob two more sons, Dan and Naphtali. Leah then thought to herself, well, if she's going to play that, I'm going to do that too. So she gave her maidservant to Jacob called Zilpah. And so Zilpah had two sons, Gad and Asher. So Jacob is building up his family rightly. But then Leah, somehow she started bearing children again. And she had two more sons, Isaacar and Zebulun, and a daughter, Dinah, who you don't really hear very much about. It then says in chapter 30 that God remembered or took pity on Rachel and she gave birth to two sons, Joseph and Benjamin. But sadly, Rachel died giving birth to Benjamin. So how many sons does Jacob end up with? 12, 12 sons and a daughter. Quite the family in today's scheme of things, it's quite the family. And it's messy. It's so complicated. It's family dysfunction at its very best. 13 children born to four different women. And in this quick summary of the family tree, we already see people in these early chapters in Genesis. These are just like chapter, we're up to 37, chapter 37 in Genesis. They're already making really bad choices. We see deception, jealousy, bitterness, selfishness, heartache, pain. 
And there's nothing new under the sun, is there? When we look at our own families and we look at ourselves, it's not really much difference to family dynamics in 2021. So it's out of all this that we arrive at the story of Joseph, who we want to focus on this morning. So when we start the story of Joseph, he's 17 years old. Like there's a couple of people here who are 17. Um, and it begins to be documented, his life story at 17. So if you want to get your Bible and turn with me to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis 37. Genesis 37. I'm just going to read the first 11 verses. Verse 1. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the son of Billah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he had made this ornate robe for him. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and they could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of corn out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered round mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. We'll find out what happens next, next time. But Joseph, Joseph, like what a beginning. He is loved by his father. He is hated by his brothers, but he is secure in God. Joseph was loved. I mean, he was prized. He was the one who would have gotten the diamond encrusted Xbox, while the rest of the family would have had to share a secondhand Game Boy. He was the one that got the biggest piece of chocolate cake, the one who would have gotten new clothes instead of hand-me-downs like all the others. Joseph was clearly favorite in this family. At least he was favorite of one person, favorite of his father, Jacob. And when we look back at that family tree and when we see how much Jacob pursued Rachel, how much he longed for her and loved her, when we see the distinction that Jacob made between her and Leah, even though Leah was able to give him child after child after child, she was never enough for Jacob. There was nothing that she could have done to win his heart. He had eyes for Rachel. His eyes were fixed on her. And so even though Leah and the servants had given him all these other children, it wasn't them that he really looked at. It was this firstborn of Rachel. And it's almost in Jacob's mind that that woman that he loved, Rachel, because it was her child, the firstborn, that was the most important. And so Joseph was really special to Jacob. He really loved them. And I'm sure Jacob loved the others too. I'm sure he was fond of them. I'm sure he was good to them. But as we read these 11 verses, there's no question that Joseph was his favorite. Some of you here may be listening and you're, you know in your heart that you're the Joseph in your family. Are you the Joseph? Any of you the Joseph? You know that you're the favorite. You get sometimes perks and benefits that no one else gets or didn't get. And perhaps parents, you're sitting here like me and you say, well, I don't have favorites. You don't want to have favorites. You're gonna treat all your children the same, but there's just some that you get on a little bit better with. They're easier to relate to. You enjoy their presence more. 
That doesn't happen in this church, obviously, because yours are all the same. But this story shows us so clearly that treating one child differently from all the others is tough on everyone. It's tough on both the favored child, it was tough on Joseph, but it's also tough on everybody else who's left out. And it's tough on the parents too, because they're going to have to deal with all the problems that favoritism um, shows. But one of the ways that uh, Jacob showed his favoritism for Joseph was in giving him this fancy coat. In that uh, musical, it's a Technicolor dream coat, but actually in the NIV, it just says it's an ornate robe. And when you read up a little bit about it, um, it, most people in those days would have worn robes that were dark colored, short sleeved, maybe to the knee. Really practical, isn't it? If it's dark colored, if you're out in the fields, it gets dirty, it's practical. Short sleeves, you can do the work. This robe may not have been brightly colored like all our pictures in the children Bibles show. It's probably more likely this long, white, pale colored robe, right to the ground, long sleeves, and then this ornate decoration right around the outside of it. So it would have looked really, really fancy. It would have stood out. And when you think of walking around in that kind of robe, were you gonna get much work done? Was it practical? No, it's the kind of robe that people would have given to like royalty or to show that you're really my favorite. I suppose in ordinary terms, Joseph got the Gucci, they got the Primark. That's what it was like. And I think, why did Jacob do this? Did Jacob not think back to all the problems in his own life? Did he not think about him and Esau and the favoritism and how it all went wrong? Did he not think of Leah and Rachel and all of the problems that were caused? We don't know if he thought of any of that, if he'd learned anything from that. All we know is that he loved Joseph. He loved him more than any of his other sons because he was born to him in his old, old age. And it's fair to say Joseph wouldn't have had any doubts in his mind, does my father love me? He wouldn't have struggled with knowing whether his daddy loved them. The daddy issues would have been very minimal for Joseph because Joseph was loved by his father. But this show of love, this favoritism, it caused problems, it caused division, it caused him to be hated by his brothers. It says that when Joseph turned 17, he's out in the fields, he's tenting the flocks of his brothers. But when he saw some of the things that his brothers were doing, he brought these stories back to his father. It doesn't tell us what they were doing. It might have been something illegal. It might have been something underhand. It may just have been laziness or messing about. We don't know, but we know that Joseph brought those stories back to his daddy. He was telling tales in their eyes. He's been a bit of a snitch or a grass. Now, no one ever likes somebody telling tales on them. And I'm sure when I think back to my own life, I, I'm as guilty as anyone in that. Sometimes if me and my brother were mucking about, things got out of hand, and I'm sure I went crying to my mummy. Sometimes it was justified, it was true, but sometimes we just tell tales to get other people into trouble and to make us look good. We see it with our own children, we see it in classes, we see it in workplaces. It always happens. And I wonder when I read this story in Genesis, what was Joseph's agenda? What was he trying to do? Was he trying to make his brothers look bad so he would look good? Or maybe he just knew that his father wouldn't be pleased with what the boys were up to. And he wanted his father's name to be kept honorable, that, um, that, that the boys would act in line with the family. Remember, Joseph was 17. These guys are a bit older. And so when he starts bringing bad reports about them back home, I don't imagine it would have really endeared him to them. And then when the father shows his favoritism by this robe, the brothers know in their hearts they're always gonna be second place. They'll never match up to Joseph. And so it says that they hated him and they couldn't speak a kind word to him. Strong language, isn't it? Strong emotions, strong reactions. No one is a winner in this situation. Joseph may have had the love of his father, but he was hated by his brothers. How differently things would have looked if Jacob would have treated them all the same. And the relationship deteriorated further when Joseph started having these dreams, dreams that were sent from God. And it made his brothers hate him even more. And when you read the, what the dreams were, 
Doesn't surprise you, does it? Imagine 11 stacks of corn bowing down to one. Sun, moon, and stars bowing down to him. It's gonna cause problems sharing that kind of dream with your family. Imagine your younger brother or sister shares a dream with you where they're gonna be your boss and you're gonna do exactly what they say. You're gonna be under their control. Joseph may have naively shared these dreams. He may not have been aware of the consequences. He may just have been so excited to have had a dream that he suspected to be from God that he just blurted it out, unaware of how it would sound. Whatever Joseph's motives or whatever his reasons for sharing, his enthusiasm was really not shared by his brothers. And even when he shared it with his own dad, his dad rebuked him, but says his dad still held it in his heart. The brothers, they just couldn't see past their jealousy to consider that anything in that dream would be true. And for Joseph, it was just like one more nail in the coffin for him. It's just another reason for them to hate him. So here we have Joseph, extremely loved, but incredibly hated all at the same time. Spoiled and bullied, encouraged and abused. Life was not easy. And knowing his place in the world would have been really hard. But Joseph's identity didn't rest in whether he was loved or hated by others because his identity was secure in God. God had clearly put his hand on Joseph's life and these dreams confirmed that God would work his purpose out in Joseph's life. Even when he faced conflict and difficulties in that moment, there was no denying that God was speaking and that Joseph had to hold on to that. His home life in that moment was dire, it was awful. It wasn't reflecting the dream that he had, but there was this certainty, this security, that his life was in God's hands because God was the giver of those dreams. God was the one who would bring them to fulfillment. God would use every single circumstance in Joseph's life to fulfill his plan. When you read this story this morning, it should give you hope. Because if God was putting things in place, circumstances and situations to fulfill his plan in Joseph's life, then surely we have the same God this morning who works in spite of our circumstances and situations and who actually uses some of these things to further what he is doing in the world. I don't know what your life or what your world looks like. Whether you are sitting here this morning and you find yourself loved or hated, whether you feel blessed or cursed, whether you feel encouraged or abused, I've no doubt for all of us in this room that there's unspoken pain probably in most of our hearts due to difficult circumstances, unfair criticism, jealous friends, Life is hard at times. It was hard for Joseph, it's hard for us. And yet, and yet when we read this story of Joseph's life, we see that it actually matters nothing if you are loved or hated by others. What actually matters is trusting that God has his sights on you, on me, that he has plans and purposes for your life, that it's his opinion of you that matters more than anything. We all want to be loved by other people. Maybe sometimes in our heart, we want to be the favorite in a group of friends. But when we hold on to this, when we live our lives wanting, wanting that to be the most important thing, to be loved by everyone, then do you know what happens? We end up feeling bitterly disappointed and hurt because you will not always be everyone's favorite. Joseph knew that. On the other hand, you may think that you're, you're living your life in the fringes. You never feel that you are truly enough, that you fit in, that you're just prized and loved for who you are. And I'm sure that the 11 sons of Jacob felt like this, as did Leah. And when they looked at Joseph, they saw somebody, he doesn't even have to work at it. He gets what he wants and he does nothing. He's getting all the affirmation and attention. He was loved beyond measure. And that caused them to hate him, resent him. They couldn't bear to speak kindly to him. They were jealous of him. When you're on the fringes, 
when you're the one that's last to get picked, last to get noticed, when you feel forgotten about, when you feel your best just doesn't cut it, your choice in that is how you respond. The brothers chose a road of hatred. They chose to focus on what they didn't have. They kept comparing themselves to Joseph, and so then they felt rage, and this rage turned on Joseph. It didn't go well. What had they forgotten? They had forgotten that they too were secure in God that they were seen by God, that they were loved by God. They weren't forgotten by God in the grand scheme of things. They just didn't see it because they were so blinded by Joseph and what he had got. If you're listening this morning and you feel that you're not enough, that you never measure up, that you'll always have to grapple to get anything, look up, look up to him, the one who actually sees you, who knows you, who loves you, who has plans, purposes, and agenda for your life. He's involved in everything that you're doing. Look up to him. Don't let jealousy, don't let looking around at what other people think, what other people are saying, what other people are doing. Don't let other people's love or hatred affect who you are, who you are made to be. Because when you do that, it's gonna ruin your life. God has not forgotten about you. When I was in college, we were often reminded to live for an audience of one. I'm sure a lot of you have heard that. And that one, the audience of one is living for God. He is the one. We were told that if we live our lives seeking the praise and applause of other people, we will either end up continually striving, performing, trying, 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 or we end up hurt and disappointed because other people will never offer us the security that God can. Some will love you, some will hate you, some will think that you're the best thing and others will view you as a waste of space. And you just can't live your life looking that from other people because it always causes pain and trouble. This beginning story of Joseph shows us that. But I would love us to live in the security of being known and loved by God, that when we hold on to him and what he has for us, that we are secure. We're not tossed up and down of who loves us, who likes us, who hates us, who dislikes us, because in him, we are enough. You know, we've just come out of uh, the Easter story. When I was looking at Joseph's life here at the start, I was thinking it was just so much like Jesus last week on earth, wasn't it? Do you remember Palm Sunday and everyone was like, yeah, we love Jesus, he's the best. And through that week, one by one, people just started to hate Jesus, started to speak unkindly to him, started to turn away from him. Even his own followers didn't live up to what they thought they would. For Jesus, if he had lived his life on the love or hatred of other people, what would he have done? He certainly wouldn't have gone to the cross. He would have turned his back on us. And yet, and yet, he chose to keep his eye on the vision that he was securing God. He was securing God's plan, what God had for him, the dream that God had for Jesus' life. In the same way of Joseph, Joseph had those dreams. He knew they were from God. So he was gonna go after that. Life, as we will see in the coming months, is not smooth, it is not easy, but he went after it. And in the same way, Jesus went after it. He didn't live his life for the applause of other people. You know, our challenge this morning as we finish is to find our security in God and what he has for us. Remember this, there will be people who love you. There will be people who hate you. You will find people who will encourage you and you will find people who will bring you down. But never ever forget that you have a God who sees you, who knows you, who loves you, who will use all of the situations in your life. So even when it's rocky, even when it's rough, even when it's shaky, God will use those situations to draw you to him, that place of security. Joseph, loved by his father, hated by his brothers, and yet secure in God. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for your word. Your word is living. 
Father, thank you that when we read the story of Joseph, there's so much that resonates with us about our own lives. Father, sometimes um, we feel the joy of being loved by others. We feel the joy of being favorite. At other times, we feel that we are on the fringe of things, that we will never fit in, that we will never be enough. At other times, Lord, we feel the hatred and the dislike of other people. Father, we don't want these things to shake us and to rock us where we um, are like a little boat caught out at sea and tossed and turned and tumbled over. Lord, we want to be steady and secure. And so, Father, today we lay these things before you. All of the comments from people, our desire for their praise, our search for people's love, our pain at being hated. Father, we lay everything before you. Father, thank you, you see us and you know all of this. And Father, as we look at the story of Joseph, we know that you take situations that are really tough, emotions that are tough to deal with. Lord, that you still work through them. So Father, today we commit to looking to you. We commit to living for an audience of one. Saying that your opinion of us, our security in you is enough. Holy Spirit, would you do that work in our hearts, reaffirm our Father's heart and love for us. We need you, God. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Um, our, final, our final song is Who You Say I Am, um, which is really fitting when we sing the words together. I'd we'll like to stand together as we sing our last song to God. Good job.
Wonderful words, aren't they? In my father's house, there's a place for me. There's always a place for all of us, and I just thank God for that every day. Let's finish by saying the grace together. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining with us. If we can help or support in any way, please do contact Brian, myself, the youth workers, or any of the elders. But God bless you.